I was blown away that we've reached the point in our media, given the like evangelical sway of this country, that you could have a show, a tremendously popular show for kids where they're like, they're straight up just like, hail Satan, praise Satan. <laughs> I was like, I felt like it's weird, but I felt like that's some progress. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is episode 54. I'm your host, Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined by my fellow Satanists, Ebony Adams what, what? and Carolyn Pettit. Yeah. I signed <laughs> the dark no words. Satanism. This is the most low energy coven. I gave you the perfect opportunity to correct yourselves. Whatever. Nobody knows what's going on. This is a show that asks you to be critical of the media you love, or alternatively, we're the feminist killjoys coming for your media, depending on your perspective. Today, we're diving into The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which is the dark remake of the lighthearted 90s show, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. After that, we'll finish by each sharing a little something in What's Your Freak Out? Now on with the show. Yo. Hey. Yo. It's uh, it's good to hear your voices. <laughs> When is this episode so, going out? Like two weeks? Hey, now, don't tell them how the sausage is made. It's fine. They know how our sausage is made. That's the worst. They These people have taken a tour through our ta- sausage facility. They know what's up. Yeah, it's a good facility, though, I have to say. Anyways, the world, listen, the way things are going these days, who knows if any of us will even be around in two weeks that to is send this true. episode out there. All right, enough intro banter, because this is terrible. <laughs> uh, how about we get a little entertainment news? Hi, everyone. Carolyn here with this week's entertainment news. I'm afraid it's fairly slim pickings this week, but I do have a few little stories to share with you. First of all, uh, this past week, during the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, not only did uh, Goku make his debut as a giant uh, balloon and have uh, had Al Roker say his name and everything, uh, but, uh, more importantly, much more importantly, um, during the broadcast, during a, a sort of, uh, song and dance number, uh, cameras briefly showed, t- uh, two, uh, women kissing, uh, during the, uh, as part of the choreographed performance, uh, a choreographed performance. And, uh, this, uh, kicked up something of a kerfuffle among conservative, um, uh, Twitter accounts and uh, and uh, organizations. Um, the the Twitter account um, for America for America um, tweeted the, the following with an image of the two women kissing from the parade. They tweeted, "Quote: Millions of small children just watched two girls kiss and had their innocence broken this morning." NBC and Macy's just blindsided parents who expected this to be a family program so they could push their agenda on little kids. Yes, uh, no doubt um, the shattered pieces of childhood innocence are um, still being picked up in uh, in households across the country. You know, meanwhile, America, uh, um, American Military forces were firing uh, tear gas at uh, refugees um, trying to uh, cross uh, into America uh, from uh, from the Mexican border. Um, you know, but uh, that's not anything to to worry about in terms of childhood innocence. But we really have to crack down on um, images of uh, two women kissing. In perhaps more uh, serious uh, news. Um, also this past week, um, a man named uh, Mason Elijah, and I may be mispronouncing that because I, I could not find um, uh, his name being pronounced out loud by any reputable source online, but um, a man named Mason Elijah, who is uh, a, a gay man, uh, came forth with uh, you know a- allegations that NBA star uh, Dwight Howard, a player for the Washington Wizards, um, uh, and his pastor, Dwight Howard's pastor, had um, threatened Elijah um, with uh, with violence um, if Elijah ever went public with uh, the, the the alleged fact that uh, Elijah and had had a physical sexual relationship with Dwight Howard. Elijah was initially wrongly. Um, reported by many 
uh, to be a, a transgender woman. Uh, uh, he, he is not. He is he is a gay man. Um, but because of the um, uh, the initial uh, perceptions and and uh, incorrect information um, spreading that Elijah was um, was a, a transgender woman. Um, there was a tremendous, tremendous amount um, of transphobia in reactions from many, many sports fans to the idea that um, the, the suggestion that Dwight Howard may have had a, uh, a sexual relationship with, um, with uh, Mason Elijah. You know, I don't pr- personally have anything uh, particularly insightful to, um, to say about that at the moment, other than that, I think that the tremendous outpouring uh, expressions of um, transphobia in response to the the uh, again the alleged um, revelations about uh, Howard um, uh, sort of indicate uh, to some degree why we live in a world in which somebody might be threatened to keep such things a secret in the first place. Not that there's any excuse whatsoever. For um, you know any such um, threats or behavior, if indeed that that did take place, um, I guess uh, what I want to do is instead just read maybe a few tweets um, that comedian w-, w. Kamau Bell tweeted um, as the news um, was was breaking um, uh, the other night because I think that they speak insightfully to um, to the situation. Um, come out tweeted, um, quote, um, until men fully accept who we are attracted to, until we encourage other men to do the same without judging them, and until we learn how to engage with the people we are attracted to in ways that are healthy and legal, we are putting the people we are attracted to in serious danger. Uh, we all know that the fact that pro sports doesn't have anywhere near the percentage of openly gay men as the rest of society means that something seriously wrongheaded and backwards is going on in those spaces. Hopefully, this Dwight Howard situation helps us address this too. I'm not going to say I've never been transphobic. I've made the quote-unquote jokes. There have been times when I've been attracted to a woman and later found out she was trans, and my response was, wait, what does that mean? Well, I've learned it means I find that person attractive. That's it. Transphobia is literally killing people, especially trans people of color. Hopefully this Dwight Howard situation can open up that discussion on a bigger level. Hopefully the TMZ-ness of this situation will quickly pass and the national discussion of of hashtag trans lives matter will remain. Um, And I think, you know, that's... uh, um, hope as well that out of this really unfortunate situation, a situation that for me as a, as a trans person, seeing the tremendous transphobia among so many sports fans um, be elicited um, by this situation, that um, I can only hope that, that this um, forces um, sports culture, sports fans to look much more closely at their own attitudes to, to provoke conversations that lead to, um, uh, serious, um, kind of, uh, uh, challenges of deeply entrenched ideas and serious kind of reflection and, and letting go ultimately of this transphobia that is so dangerous and deadly um, to to so to so many uh, people. Um, that's going to do it for this week's entertainment news. Back to Anita, Ebony, and I in the past. Did you know that we can keep bringing Feminist Frequency Radio to the airwaves because of you? It's true. If you're enjoying our show, please consider joining our podcast community at d.rip slash femfreak. You'll get access to some fun perks and bonus episodes. So that's d.rip slash femfreak. Now moving on to the main topic for this week. The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. It is a Netflix show. I wrote nothing to introduce this show because it was just not worth it. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so who did you watch the show? The t- um, the t- t- wow! Oh boy! <laughs> Should we just start again from the very beginning? Because I'm <laughs> clearly brain dead. Did you all watch the '90s show, Sabrina the Teenage Witch? No, heck, not no. at all. Not nope. at all. I was not oh. interested in it. But like, but you have an idea of what it is. It was oh, yeah. Obviously, yeah. All, this is- all I know 
about that is that it had a very cute but very fake looking cat um, on it. That's all I really know Voiced about by the, Nick the, the, the 90s wow. Sabrina. All right. Well, I feel like that must have been like a gen. Like it was definitely I was a kid when that was on. So I, I did watch it. But so, OK, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is getting, you know, people are really into it right now. It has the same showrunner as uh, Riverdale. So like it's tonally similar in taking these like fluffy media properties um, and turning them into sort of darker, more adult kind of things, I guess. And it's like, set in the same universe, right? Well, yeah. So, so, so it is. And actually, I learned recently that Sabrina was actually supposed to be the big bad on Riverdale, but they didn't end up doing that. So, but there's going to definitely be crossovers um, or there is, it is assumed that there will be crossovers in the future. And Riverdale is mentioned several times as like the neighboring town to uh, Greendale, which I is I bet where... there are people who are just delighted by that. I'm news. sure they are. So also, also Sabrina the Teenage Witch is an Archie comics yeah. comic that um, Yeah, like I remember reading the comics. Originated oh. in the in uh October of nineteen sixty two. Jesus Christ. I don't think I knew that. I mean yeah, maybe she was, she was very round brain. and cute like Casper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, so um I watched the whole thing. Sorry. How much did you all watch? Five episodes? I watched the first four episodes. Oh, my God. Why did I? Th- I this wasn't even my idea. This was Carolyn's idea to watch this shit. It's it not wasn't, a good show. <laughs> it wasn't like I, my idea. I don't know. I was, like, I was this, glad it was to watch things- it. Be, be, having read that Angelica Bastien piece, which Carol will link to in the show description, I was really um, eager to watch it, you know? So... I'm not going to yeah, let Carol okay, take well, okay. all the well, heat so for this. So I think that I'm the only one of us that also watched Riverdale, right? You for sure are. And that's okay. going to remain a fact. <laughs> so I watched two seasons of Riverdale, um, which Angelica Bastian, who we all respect and admire a lot. Um, and who has really been a liked. guest on the podcast. Yeah. We should have her on again. But mm-hmm. that said, um, I think, you know, like when we admire critics, it doesn't mean we agree with everything they have to say. And I think that she likes some of the like fluffy CW or some of the not fluffy, um, some of this very specific, I, I kind of call it this sort of CW style because it's like, you know, really specific casting of like beautiful ripped human beings. Right. Um, I think Riverdale is, I don't think it's a good show, but it is definitely a watchable show. Um, whereas Sabrina, I felt like was just, really cheesy in ways that I couldn't get past and it got weirder and darker but like not necessarily better um and it took me like two hours to get through the first episode because I kept stopping and doing things and then like got me back the the first episode was painful I will say that um I I wouldn't by any stretch of the imagination say that I enjoyed watching the show, but I kept, you know, watching more episodes. So clearly it was effective on that level. But I will say this, if you are at all interested in watching it, do not judge the show based upon the first episode because oh, it is so bad. dire. It is yeah. it is really, really dire. So, so give it at least two episodes before you make your determination. So the show is like, you know, taking a really, you know, dark and twisted take on, you know, this sort of, happy-go-lucky sitcom that's sort of like funny and like you know for kids uh and i i think i was very surprised at how they did it so it turns out that in this world witches are actually a part are, are like they worship satan and that threw me because i was like well i, I didn't i just didn't assume that they were going to go in that direction and satan is like you know evil a go- As- he's like a goat creature, you know, like there's the, the associations there of Satan with like this kind of creature who takes like a goat man type form. It's all there. Like it's 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 much more kind of rooted in actual kind of myths and stuff or, you know, for lack of a better term around Satan than I expected it to be. Yeah, it's definitely rooted in Christian myths about good and yeah. evil and yeah. like the people who are witches and are like a member of this church. Oh, I forget. What the path called. of night. Yeah, they um, they're bad people theoretically, right? Like they, you know, they're okay torturing and they get off on like other people suffering. And you know, if you join the church in your baptism, you have to do Satan's bidding. Um, yeah, I, I was kind of like, I was, 
I found it kind of refreshing that the the show really went for it on that level. So they didn't try and, um, you know, have it both ways such that like, oh, you know, here are witches. Um, and, and, and I'm talking specifically about the universe of the show, you know, but like, here are our witches. Um, but they're also, they're, they may swear allegiance to a moral code that you don't agree with, but they're basically fine and good people and whatever. This show straight up says like, no, we worship the devil. And if we are yeah, required to murder people or be absolutely horrible, like we kind of relish it. We, we, we are all in on evil. Like they just, they chewed it up. I mean, this show is so so campy and there is so much overacting and it's it's entertaining on some level it can be a bit cloying episode by episode but i did kind of appreciate that and like i was i was blown away that we've reached the point in our media given the like evangelical sway of this country that you could have a show a tremendously popular show for kids where they're like they're straight up just like hail satan praise satan i was like i felt like it's weird but i felt like that's some progress i don't know i I was seriously surprised by that too like i i thought my god where are all the people who are like up in arms about this yeah well well the church of satan did sue them okay yeah, so, but that's the Church of Satan. Where are the people who didn't want us to have Cabbage Patch dolls because you know, or who didn't yeah. want us to read Harry Potter? You know, I feel like we're at the we've gone from Harry Potter, which is so like it's like vanilla pudding when it comes to like you know witches and warlocks compared to this show. Like this is straight up like it's like the the CW version of the witch, right? <laughs> you know, like it's not nearly as smart or as sophisticated, but like you can imagine people in. This this show actually grinding babies up um, in the way they do in The Witch. Like, that would not be out of the realm of possibility. And yet for all the, like, the darkness and, you know, the kind of, the way it it really tries to, you know, play up that aspect, there's, it's, it's, it, there's always this, like, goofy, uh, mm-hmm. it's balanced out by this goofiness. And one of my favorite little, I mean, manifestations of that is the way that, you know, so there's this, um, there's these court proceedings at one point where there is like a, a tribunal of judges, you know, mm-hmm. from the, the church of the Satan or the path of night, I guess. And, and they're just called like your dishonors. Like instead yeah. of like your honors, it's just, Oh, your <laughs> you're dishonors. Disorder in it's the like court. this like, little tongue in cheek joke. Like, Oh, of course they're, you just, you just like reverse everything yeah. about, you know, mortal society. You just mm-hmm. make everything that's like good. You make it bad. And like, there's something fun about that, but also like, so cheesy and goofy and so just what a what a weird tonal you know collision of things is happening in this show from the first episode i was like who is this for like who is this show for obviously i'm not the target audience for this but i suspect that like 13 year old ebony would have loved this fucking show oh my god 13 year old ebony would have eaten this shit up is Riverdale, um, like this show really puts a lot of effort and energy into creating a, uh, a world out of time. You know, there's yeah. like, there, everyone's using rotary phones. There's old black and white photographs. The library has a fucking card catalog. The costuming. That the t- teenagers use. Like, is Riverdale kind of like that too? No. Like, like a kind of I mean, there's six- definitely like the diner, but that's not, it's definitely okay. modern. It's, it's much more modern. Okay, but I think that the oldness of it is supposed to show that, like, it's like an it's like the, the Orthodox Satanists, right? Like, it's as if you had like the Orthodox <laughs> Church, sure, um, uh-huh. but I mean, all super traditional, old school, right? Yeah, but the whole town is this way. Even the mortals, like, they don't, you know, the cars are all from like the nineteen sixties and seventies. Like, uh, you know, there's like old black and white televisions. Everything is like not new, you mm-hmm. know, regardless of whether they're witches or or mortals the whole town just feels kind of trapped in time in a way can i ask a a question and maybe anita you can answer this because you've seen the whole um season but i was confused about some very basic shit so where aunt hilda and aunt zelda one has an american accent one has an english accent but they are sisters right where are they from they, I don't, I have no idea. They don't say. Okay. And then the Ambrose, Ambrose is also a member of the Spellman family. 
Yeah. He is a person of color. Where did he come from? No idea. But so I really, really like Ambrose. He's one of the only characters that oh. I gave a shit about. And I really yeah. wish there was much, much more of him. Me too. Oh, Here's the thing, though. The, the reason why I bring up Ambrose is because this show does something that drives me absolutely ape shit and happens all the time in mainstream media such that they will call themselves multiracial but what they mean is they have one or two people of color or from some other subject position right as if you know being a person of color in these environments you are sui generis all the time we rarely see other mem- like members of their family who are also people of color we stare them seldom see them interacting with other people of color in friend groups they are these addendums in these all white environments. And it drives me absolutely bananas. The shows like this, like I watched this and it made me envy. I wanted to watch Sleepy Hollow again because I was like, there's a way to do these shows that are set in small town North England, but that don't give the lie to the fact that these are all white environments because that is a myth. That is not well, the case. We've talked about before, I think we've talked about before on the podcast about like the attempt that like Hollywood realizes that it can't be all white and all dudes all the time. And so it like, and and that like it keeps trying to be progressive in these ways that feel very surface level. And I think that it, especially in the first episode, they do this a bunch because they talk about like, let's start a club to topple the white patriarchy and like, let's call it Wiccans or Wicca or whatever, because they we couldn't call it Daughters of the Black Panthers. And like, you know, it, that has nothing to do with the show and it has nothing to do with the themes of the show in any way. But it's like. It's almost throwing a bone being like, yeah, we're progressive. Look at us. Look, look, we got three people of color on this show. Isn't that cool? Or yeah. Cool and like, it, you know, the I in Wicca uh, stands for intersectional. Like, I was like, come on, y'all. Come on. Also, like, so I, I only watched, as I said, I only watched four episodes, four episodes in like 20 minutes of the fifth episode. And but like, there's there's a whole lot of talk on the show about, you know, it, it's trying to to present itself as feminist you know as you say like there's the line about top of the weight the white patriarchy and everything and and yet like um at least as far as i got in the show by you know even though yes okay the dark lord is a, a man and like the uh, obviously a male figure etc like by far by far the most like dangerous and threatening uh you know figures in sabrina's life or in the show uh to me seem to almost universally be be women you have like the 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 three um the trio of i forget what they're called but the yeah and you know you have like uh uh the 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 being that takes the form of mrs uh miss wardwell you know the at school and and so i'm like okay and and you know within the ecosystem the show doesn't really i don't know it doesn't seem to present the 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 male figures as as threatening or dangerous or anything as these and so I, I i felt a kind of there was a certain discomfort for me with that like the way that that the women are by far the most kind of dangerous uh figures on on the show yeah i mean i think obviously they're taking um you know a a creative project you know that that existed prior to this iteration so there are some things they can and they can't do but I have friends who practice Wicca, um, and I have no idea what they think about this show. But but I was uncomfortable with the way that this yeah they they set up this um, this tension in the show between women wanting power and only being able to achieve a certain level of power because this masculine figure, you know, at the head um, will give them power, but will not give them freedom at the same time. So that's kind of like one of the the central um, issues that Sabrina, you know, isolates as a reason for not wanting to sign her name in the Book of the Beast, you know, is that she, she wants to maintain her free will and she recognizes that the Church of Satan is offering some false version of free will ultimately. Ultimately. But I just it's not the like, Church of Satan. Don't sue us. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the path of night. Path of night. Um, but so I, I just was like, you know, you didn't have to offer this kind of facile treatment of this particular issue, but also of Wicca and witchcraft in general. Like witchcraft is a genuine religious practice, right? Like it doesn't just exist in fiction. It's not something just that, you know, people were accused of, um, you know, in 
uh, in England, you know, or Europe back in the day, or in, you know, Salem, Massachusetts. Like it's a living, breathing religious practice. And so the way that it's, you know, kind of used as a stand in for these easy arguments, I wasn't entirely comfortable with. And the way that they inserted men into the story and made them these sort of figures of outsized importance, I also was like, eh, this was unnecessary to me. Having said that, I was glad Bronson Pinchot was getting work. Love seeing that. Dude. Dude. Yes. So good. I mean, if, if you want somebody to overact the hell out of something. Sorry, who does he play? Principal Hawthorne. The principal. Uh, yeah. If you want, if you need an actor to like overact the fuck out of something, get Bronson Pinchot. <laughs> so I actually, I, I uh, Sabrina herself, I think, is um, played by Kieran Shipka, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, Kieran. Kieran. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I... The way that they present her and the way that she looks like she's always wearing a little headband and she's like this sort of dainty little girl kind of thing. Like, I I appreciate that she speaks with presence and she speaks with confidence and she doesn't um, she doesn't back down by intimidation. Like, I think that there is something I think I I appreciate the casting and I appreciate like even the the level um, not the tone of her voice, but like the the maturity of her voice, I guess, um, is not what I expected to come out of that face, if that makes sense. Like it would be really easy to to have someone a little squeaky and a little like um, l- less assured in yeah. that role. And I and at no point does she ever fall into that. She's always like, no, like I will not be taken advantage of. I will not whatever. I have to help my friends. I have to do these things. Um, and I'm going to figure it out. And I, I, I like that. She's a very different. I was thinking about this while watching the show, how she's a very different kind of central figure than, say, someone like, uh, you know, um, like uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar's Buffy, for instance, who, you know, exudes a completely different kind of charisma and confidence, in my view, like um Kiernan Shipka who like I spent I spent my whole time watching this like oh my god where do I know her from where do I know her from not looking it up and then finally I looked it up and of course she's like um Don Draper's daughter on Mad Men oh my like, oh, god no um, shit yeah um, oh I didn't even she didn't even look familiar to oh me. she looks yeah, so familiar she bugging the yeah. hell out of me but I, I I tortured myself for a long time until I finally looked it up um but yeah, like she has this more kind of restrained, like her acting is more kind of restrained. It's more like quiet. And, but, but, but as you say, there's, there's that real, there's that kind of will, that confidence there. I don't know if I agree with that. Oh. Um, I, like, no, sorry. I don't feel like if she, there's a quiet restrainedness there. Okay. Um, although you're welcome to have sure. that opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, um, how dare you not agree with me about this? <laughs> I think that one of the problems, however, is that she is out the gate, this like sort of confident, assured woman that like there's not a lot of movement. So I think that she's very one note. And I don't know. It's not necessarily her acting. It's just like th- this is what was written for her. And while there is something that happens later on where she like is very confident about a choice that she makes and it was the fucking wrong choice and like there's repercussions to it and blah, 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 blah. Like I still it still doesn't feel like character development to me. It just like it feels like every episode they're throwing something out to like that she has to solve um, in a way that was the little boring to me. No, I was going to say, wasn't there one episode that was like scary as fuck? And I watched it right before I went to bed and I was like, nobody told me this was a goddamn horror movie (laughs) from the very beginning of the show. Like the first scene when um, the original Mrs. Wardwell, you know, buttoned up bun haircut, Mrs. Wardwell is driving her car down that deserted road and, you know, sees that, um, that that young girl behind her on the road and picks her up like that was scary as fuck. You should have known from the beginning. This yeah, show but was there was one there. episode that was specifically what was it? I can't even remember what it was now. Probably one that Ebony and I didn't even see. Yeah, and which I'm not going to. Uh, although, I mean, there are moments in every episode that are just horrifying. Look, like when she eats the malice, whatever the apple, um, and then it turns into like the maggoty old rotted apple. Oh my god! Although it was hilarious because when she went up to that old tree, I very much was expecting a Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz situation where the tree was going to come alive and be like, "How would you like it if someone picked something out of you?" But unfortunately, okay, so we have we did to talk about that. Susie. Yes. Um. So Susie is a trans character, a trans woman on the show. Is and she? 
Yeah. It just really? Like, yeah. Does like, that, is that made clear or is that a, yes. is that a transaction? Okay, I'm just asking. I didn't know. I, I, I'm answering your question because you asked me five times. Susie is trans. Okay. Um. Well, so you didn't get far enough. Ugh, y'all, you need to watch the show I'm not going so we to. can talk about it. But No, so, I knew that, you know, there were issues with So like, in the first episode, she there's like trans violence, like transphobic violence against her where they force her to lift up her shirt. So... So there's this weird thing that happens where, like, they actually have conversations about it where um, Sabrina's like, I need to protect my friends. I need, like, I need them to not be, you know, bullied. And, like, these dudes are beating her up and all of this shit and calling her names. And then there's a, a moment way later in, like, a couple of episodes. There's such weird shit that happens. And I don't want to super spoil it. But there is a a woman, um, Jazz's grandmother called Nan, who is blind, um, calls Susie a young man. And Susie's OK with it, even though she is trying really hard to be, you know, like to to be taken seriously as a woman. And that was really fucking weird to me that that was like all of a sudden. OK, I don't believe that she's trans. I think she's like non Maybe she starts wearing dresses, right? But she's it's a, it's like a plot point in the show. But she's a she's a cis she's assigned female at birth. I don't think so. That was my understanding too. That she was um, that the issue was that she was being perceived as insufficiently yeah. feminine, but that she was in fact a cisgender uh, young woman. Um, right. But that you know was not particularly interested in presenting in an overtly feminine way. And so the actor Laclan Watson identifies as non-binary and plays a non-binary character on Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. So they, uh, they are non-binary. But I don't. Okay. I don't. Do you believe know what episode? Like about when? For, okay. I don't know how many episodes are in the first season, but do you know when they start to? tackle more of her story Anita because I missed I, I saw it through episode five yeah okay so I'm I'm sorry I'm looking this up right now because it, it the these articles are saying that she's or that they're non-binary on the show but I that that I can I can see that being the case it's very confusing the way it's presented on the show then because it was pretty clear to me that like they they referred to their group of friends as women like yeah mm-hmm. I, because so, I mean Right. I, 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 my, my sense of, of the character of Susie is that they, um, is that the character is, you know, uses female pronouns and was, but just, uh, just, um, it, it performs and exhibits a very, uh, non traditional, non feminine, uh, version of femaleness. I guess, although that's cool. getting. Into- I read that completely differently. Yeah. So awesome. <laughs> so sorry. That's very interesting. I want to. I want to watch these these episodes because I also didn't get to the episode. I ch- I thought I would get there, but I had to tap out. The one where we learn more about Prudence, who was an absolutely fascinating character as well. Um, so if I do dip back in, maybe I'll go into those specific episodes. Well, so episode nine, um, uh, Jazz's grandmother specifically calls her a young man um and so so if that's of interest to you i know that it happens in an and then there's also um there's also like a ghost thing that shows up that genders Susie in different ways so there, there's a there's a lot happening with Susie's gender yeah i mean Susie is definitely being tormented for not it performing femininity you know in a traditional way i mean the, the show like it really <sighs> I thought if they if they were going to go there, that would have been great. I mean, most of the stuff that happens in the mortal world was so boring to me. Like the show as a whole didn't <laughs> I wasn't super invested in. But the stuff in the mortal world, I was super uninvested in, whether it was Harvey, her boring ass boyfriend. He was or- so boring. That was going to be the next point I brought up. Oh, Lord. And it gets worse because he becomes more important. Oh, and, God. Oh, Lord. Yeah, I just, Lord. I, I did not care. Satan. Hail Satan. Yeah. Get Harvey <laughs> off the show. <laughs> but I mean, I felt like um, the things, the show wanted to offer really interesting commentary about like disability, right? With Roz um, going blind. We learned that she's going blind. Um, and then Susie 
Um, yeah, and that you, but you don't know why she's going blind yet, so just wait till you get Okay, and part. then, and you know, so Susie <laughs> and the gender issues there, um, there's, you know, occasionally kind of, a, you know, a nod into class issues, but for the most part, any kind of transgressive or progressive reading you want to assign to this show is something is a left reading that the viewer is going to have to bring to it. I don't know that the show itself supports because ultimately the show is still in very invested in this very CW, um, you know, kind of sanctioned version of masculinity, femininity, you know, privileged white supremacy, you know, um, entitlement. Like I don't see that it's actually doing anything um, interesting or new other than simply flipping things into opposite day land. So like Carol pointed out, when they have the the court for the path of night, it's disorder in the court, it's your dishonors, et cetera. Like that's not enough. They, I just, I didn't, I don't feel like the show um, had earned the ability to talk about some of these more weighty issues. And I think that particularly in regards to race in this show, because, and I know this is a gross word, but the optics of a, sort of very demure, you know, virginal, pure, small, young white woman hoisting a larger black woman up. And, you know, essentially what we're looking at is like a lynching, right? When during the harrowing, um, anytime when Prudence talks about someone being a half breed, um, you know, demonstrating kind of the racism within the, the witch world. Um, like I was just, I was incredibly uncomfortable because I just don't feel like the show had built up enough, um, sort of weight for it to take on these issues, given that we were looking at two women, one black, one white in opposition to each other. And it just, the reading, it's too easy to read those along established racist lines. Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely been actually a, a lot of discussion around the, that scene in particular around, you know, as you say, the optics of it, prudence, you know, the, the, the lynching aspect and, um, and the aforementioned, uh, critic Angelica Bastien wrote a, a whole piece about it. She has her own, you know, viewpoint on it that, uh, I suspect Ebony, you would not agree with, but, um, but, um, it's certainly, yeah, troubling. And there's, Anyway, there's been a lot of a lot of conversation around around that image in particular, for sure. Final thoughts. I mean, are you going to watch more? You know, like so the the very first thing that happens in in this series is like they're at the movie, like Sabrina and her friends are at the movies. They're watching like some zombie movie or whatever, and they walk out, and everyone's talking about like why were the zombies so slow? And Sabrina like schools her friends on how like. Well, you know, uh, fast moving zombies are actually like a recent development. And, you know, and like I felt myself getting, I, you know, it's that kind of, uh, it, it, I'm not proud of the feeling, but I was like, oh my God, like seriously, have none of these kids heard of like 28 days later? Or don't they know about like how fast moving <laughs> zombies are like a recent thing, et cetera? Uh-huh. And, like, um, so I immediately felt like, okay, you know, I need to cool off. I need to step back, but I'm just probably not the audience for this series. Like, it's just aimed at, like, and and nothing that happened in the episodes that I watched changed that feeling at all. Um, I, I'm I'm really interested in the conversations around it, you know, and, and if it has a second season, which I suspect it will, like... It does. I'll be interested to see, you know, where thematically it goes and what people are discussing around it there. But I don't see it being a show that I myself um, feel inclined to to watch. So sorry. <laughs> How dare yeah. you? You promised to write your name in the book of the beast. Oh. <laughs> and you're going back on that pledge. Oh, but guess what happens? I'm not going to say. All right. Uh, are we done with this? No, you should just tell us because I'm not going to watch anymore. No, I'll watch those episodes, the Susie episode, and I'll watch the one about Prudence. But I'm uh, any anytime people will be talking about this on Twitter, if I get interested, I'll just read Wikipedia episode summaries. Wic- Wicca, right. Wikipedia, W I C C A. Hey, the official, Hello. the official Sabrina, the you know teenage witch fan. Uh, Fifty wiki? points to Gryffindor. Very good. <laughs> Which, speaking of that, every time. Uh, Sabrina's parents appeared like in a vision. It just reminded me of Harry Potter, which is another series that sue me. I just don't give enough of a shit about. But I was like, well, I don't know. I just I want more interesting stuff happening in adolescent fantasy. All right.
right, let's move on to <laughs> what's your freak out? Ebony? Uh, my freak out is Thanksgiving. I have complicated thoughts about the holiday specifically because it is a um, imperialist colonialist relic. And so I try and, you know, try and divorce things from that probably unsuccessfully. But my freak out this week is I'm going to celebrate with family. Um, I am getting my life once again, as I do every year from um the hashtag Thanksgiving with Black Families. I encourage all of you to do the same. Um, I continue with my mission every year to teach Anita about what she can expect if she ever does have Thanksgiving with my Black ass family. And that's what I'm freaking out about this week. That's it. Awesome. Carolyn? Uh, I am freaking out about our just terrible, terrible, just colossal idiotic embarrassment of a president who had the, I mean, just the gall, the temerity, just the self, the colossal self-absorption to come here to California, to go to Northern California, where the death toll from the recent fires, you know, is, is, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of people like far and, and with so many people still missing uh, people, you know, not, uh, probably some people are never going to be identified because of the the horrific uh, circumstances and uh, uh, in which they 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 perish and just everything that happened in paradise in that area. And President Trump has just the the again just the I, I can't even imagine having a colossal enough ego and being so in, incapable of seeing beyond yourself that he comes and he says something about like people you know that the, the, the people didn't like rake their leaves enough or something and he says that like he discussed this with the finnish i don't know president or prime minister that you know that uh, oh yeah no that the people didn't rake their leaves enough and now, of course the finnish official to whom he's referring is like what the fuck i never said what the fuck is he talking about i never said that i mean just like people are dead the 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 devastation is is it's just colossal. It's hard for us to even wrap our minds around what has taken place uh, in Northern California. And like, I mostly can no longer be surprised by anything that Trump says or does, but my God, I was so just so outraged, so outraged at the nerve of this pathetic man coming here and saying such i mean just offensively empty vacuous things in the wake of this just tremendous you know human tragedy uh and he didn't even get the name of the town of paradise right like of the few things we ask him to hold in his brain and he he called the town pleasure oh my god and i didn't like, even you know, see that i was so yeah, outraged like, about everything and else. i just thought you know I, he can't do and he can't be human, a real human, and think outward for even one second. He literally, he clearly has not a single, not the tiniest shred of empathy for the 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 loss, the devastation, the grief, the people who lost their lives or livelihoods. Just nothing whatsoever beyond his own. Just, just I mean, his his own ego and it's it's just it's just it's just the it's just the the absolute worst it's so it's it's just so shameful and embarrassing and infuriating and disgusting and everything it's awful well i'm gonna wrap both of these up together in my freak out Yay. sort of um i watched john leguizamo's latin history for morons oh yeah Did either of you see that no so uh I, like i say that because you know there are definitely jabs at Trump in it. And there's also like the the legacy of colonialism and imperialism is very tied up into what he's trying to correct, which hello, Thanksgiving. So um, I think it's really wonderful and I highly recommend it. Um, it's it's entertaining and fun and it'll probably actually be instructive on aspects of um, Latinx history that you may not have known or like the just how how advanced a lot of these um, 
ancient, like how these civilizations that have completely disappeared because they were literally murdered um, and genocides committed, um, but we don't ever give them credit for how much work they they really did and and how like vivid and incredible um, their communities were, and just 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 how utterly horrifying it is um, that the that we don't, they're not with us anymore, right? And that all of that has been erased and we have now implemented these fucking holidays um, in it's sort of in celebration of the victors of these horrific crimes. Um, there's a couple of books that he recommends on it that I actually am also going to recommend. So 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus um, by Charles Mann is fucking great. And then also, if you haven't um, read A People's History, by Howard Zinn. Those are both really important, incredible books about um, like correcting the history books. I will say, however, that there are definitely moments in the the, the show that were a little cringy. Um, and I think that there is a fine line between being like sexual and being sexist sometimes. Um, you know, like there's jokes about um, how like anal sex is the thing that you get on your birthday because, you know, like it's very heteronormative and like very specific ideas about like gender and sexual relationships. Um, there are, he does a lot of impressions and some of them are really good. And, and like the way he uses his body and the environment, I think is really, really fun and interesting, but you know, like he, he, does the voice of his one of his family members who's deaf and like that made me re- kind of uncomfortable you know like there there are little there are things like that that i'm like uh, maybe not do that like it sounds like you're making fun of him right and you're making fun of this person with um this disabled person um so you know like it's not without some some questionable moments in terms of, of like reinforcing some oppressive ideas, but overall I, I still recommend it and think that it's really smart. Uh, you can submit your own freak out and it might make it on the show. Just head over to feministfrequency.com slash freak out. That's F R E Q O U T. You can catch us back here every single Wednesday. And stay tuned for the bonus episode, which is only available as a backer of this podcast. Are you a backer of this podcast? If you're not, you should be. You can do that at d.rip slash femfreak. And if you're enjoying the show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And when you're about to sign your name in the book of the... The Beast. Um... Yeah, the Book of the Beast. Um, while you're at your baptism and saying your little speech about, you know, loving Satan and shit, you should also be like, I also love this podcast. And then all of your Satan worshiping friends will um, listen to us. And that would be great. All right. You can check out all of our work and our other podcasts at FeministFrequency.com. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at FemFreak to stay up to date on all the news. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at Anita Sarkeesian. I'm at Carolyn Michelle. I am at Batty Bat. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Technical support by Sarah Norales. Production assistance by Taylor Simmons. And art by Jamie Varon. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.